I'd like to wish you again a warm welcome to the sequence of Europe calling. My name is Ben Giegold. I'm the speaker of uh, the Greens uh, IFA in the European Parliament. Uh, together with Sarah Nani today, a colleague from my local area and uh, party a peace researcher for the German Bundestag. And uh, I have organized a seminar with Sarah because the situation is uh, seriously shocking. What we see every day, what we have been seeing for the last uh, weeks from Afghanistan cannot leave you uh, calm. Uh, we need a political discussion of these topics. And as a member of the European Parliament, I'm particularly concerned because Europe um, itself was actively in Afghanistan. Therefore, I'm glad that Andrea Thies is here with three uh, missions, missions whose uh, local staff uh, doesn't know what's going to happen to them, as happens to many who work for German organizations. Therefore, I thought it's very important that we talk about it today. Sarah Nani is going to be the anchor today, uh, the moderator. I'd like to say a few technical thing, things. Uh, these seminars are, or webinars are part of a series. We've done it for about a hundred times now with experts, um, scientists, uh, NGOs. Uh, have we been discussing issues from a European perspective and uh, also giving the citizens a possibility to um, talk to experts, to politicians, to put their questions to us and uh, to inform themselves better. Um, today we have four particularly interesting guests uh, with us. And as always, you have the possibility to ask questions for this. You should use the FNA or Q&A function, Q&A in English. You can uh, type in your questions or remarks. You should also say who you are if you speak for an organization. Uh, then that would be important for us and you could help us because in general we receive many many questions far more than we can answer and therefore i'd suggest that you um, like the ones you uh, think are the most important questions so that we can then discuss the most important and interesting issues with you and you should also write in a question to whom it is addressed um, this meeting is public, uh, which means that we are going to record in English and in German the whole thing and um, put it online then so that those who have not been able to follow us now uh, will be able to do that later. But um, also as a warning, if you uh, use your name, uh, it will then later be uh, visible in the internet. So things which you find are important or things you don't know, um, things you hear, uh, you can um, quote or you can uh, write about them in the social media, which is good, we think, because that gives our um, meeting more impact. And the same is true uh, for the participants. Uh, so far, we have uh, 1,200 registrations for today's uh, webinar, which, show, which shows that the interest is really great and more people could still come and register. Thank you very much for having found the time. And maybe I can start with those who are not directly from our club. Uh, Markus Grotian, uh, chairman of the um, um, partnership uh, or twinning network. Afghan local staff uh, who spoke out clearly, who has been speaking out clearly in the last uh, few weeks and at the European Union. Uh, we have Sarah de Jong responsible for the doing about the same thing as uh, Marcus in the Netherlands and in the UK. Then Andrea Thies, thank you very much uh, that uh, you have also been able to participate in our seminar. And then we have Vinny Nachtwey, um, Afghanistan expert uh, for the last 20 years. He has uh, organized and followed um, many uh, meetings, uh, has written many um, expertises and um, also a member of the network of Mr. Grotian. So I first introduced uh, Mr. Grotian to you and I would like to pass the word now uh, directly to Sana Nani, our moderator for today. I think the meeting is going to be highly interesting and exciting. And uh, I, with great pleasure, I give you the floor because the topic is very, very difficult. Sarah, you have the floor. 
Okay. Gerade war kurz der Ton weg, aber ich glaube, ich bin yeah, wieder... Yeah, I couldn't hear for a minute, but I think uh, you can hear me. Good evening, everybody. I don't have to uh, say many things as an introduction, because Sven has this, done this already. Therefore, I'd like with the first question address to Winnie Nachtwey. Winnie, you uh, for 20 years uh, have been uh, dealing with this uh, issue. And uh, I think the deeper you're involved with this topic, the more difficult it is uh, to understand how others see the topic. And I'm asking you, how do you see the development uh, in the course of the last uh, few months? This dynamic of the last months is what I mean. Uh, how did you perceive it? So that uh, we can have a short introduction into to the security political situation, the way it uh, presents itself at the moment. Well, good evening. Thank you. Uh, good evening to all of you, even though you're invisible. Uh, in September, half a year late, uh, the, interior, in the internal Afghan peace talks began uh, after the um, front Taliban um, agreement, on which I'm not going to speak. And uh, we had uh, support by mediators um, on the German side. And uh, then, well, how can I put it, as is usual in such meetings, uh, the whole process is very cumbersome. The atmosphere I have heard was not bad, but uh, despite everything, things were difficult. And the troops, especially the American troops, uh, have already been downsized uh, during this process, a downsized to a number of only several thousand in the whole country. And um, on the other side, we had the Taliban. And on April 14th, the new American President Biden um, announced his course, his political course. And that was a surprise because it had been clear that uh, he wanted a fast withdrawal. That was consensus also with us. But the withdrawal without condition, that was the surprise i.e. without any um, agreements with the Taliban, uh, pledges to reduce violence or on a, as to a ceasefire. That was not uh, linked to, to the, the American withdrawal. And the original deadline uh, for withdrawal end of April could not be met. Uh, but as from May, uh, the overall withdrawal of international troops began. And that happened very quickly, because that is what was announced uh, until the 11th of September. Everybody should be out, it was said. And uh, Biden uh, said, uh, if possible, even earlier. The negotiations in Doha then uh, didn't really uh, take place. There were large breaks between the meetings. And was re what was uh, remarkable or was that uh, the, the conflict uh, uh, was marked by a split. Um, the Taliban didn't attack the international troops, uh, we noted, but at the same time, attacks of government troops, uh, uh, security troops, and um, employees in the civilian area of the government, uh, human rights activists, journalists increased. So in the last year, we can say that there was an increase by 170 percent uh, compared to the previous year of um, intentional killings, especially of uh, local staff. And what's important is that uh, many attacks uh, do not have any uh, and a name attached to it. So that was very intimidating, had a very intimidating effect. And in the end, finally, as from June, there have been countrywide offenses in which uh, per day, 12 or 10 districts uh, were uh, conquered by the Taliban. And this happened extremely fast, this happened with a velocity nobody had expected in the past. And what, what was remarkable as to their strategy was that they went north very fast. And in the north, well, 
uh, the whole thing had a strategic um, intention because in the north uh, you had the power basis of the so-called elite in Kabul uh, and uh, which used to be withdrawal or um, retreat uh, areas for the Taliban. So the whole, all those provinces where the Bundeswehr, the German uh, armed forces, uh, have been stationed, uh, um, were stationed only a while ago. All these places were taken, and then, as from the from August sixth, uh, the attacks uh, on provincial capitals um, flared up. And uh, it was remarkable here, as it has been in the case of the districts, that the, most of the takings or conquests took place without battle, which means that there have been a lot of um, agreements uh, between the actors already before these occurrences. And uh, within 10 days, nearly all provincial capitals fell. Also, the, the large cities with uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of inhabitants. And you may recall last Sunday, then the capital itself and uh, Kabul also fell uh, more or less without violence, without direct violence at least. So what uh, had been dreaded, that there is a huge showdown, um, street combats, uh, a huge battle with horrific consequences. Well, this is something that at least so far has not taken place. So this is the last uh, aspect, uh, the Afghan security. This is the aspect I think we should bear in mind, namely that the Afghan security forces gave up without a battle. That has uh, understandable reasons, namely uh, that they had a political leadership uh, which was uh, corrupt, which was um, divided, and uh, the vital support uh, by the USA, uh, well, was not given any longer, uh, and uh, the military equipment was standing in the yard, court in the yard, and uh, could not be used anymore. So the whole system broke down. The security forces had nothing for which uh, they were willing to fight. Uh, they had no um, perspective uh, to uh, reach anything to attain anything. And therefore, I think this, that capitulation uh, was the most reasonable thing, even if the result, well, is uh, horrible as such. But uh, the other option would have led to a horrible bloodbath, I believe. Uh, that's all. Mr. Young, uh, during the entire mission, uh, there have been uh, locally employed civilians and activists uh, threatened by the Taliban. When, um, at what point over the last month or even the past year, did you notice that the ones who have to uh, get out of Afghanistan aren't getting out, we're not helping, so I have to do something about that? Uh, to uh, whom was the question? Was it to me or uh, to Mr. Gossian? It was actually to everyone who was involved in getting those who need protection out of Afghanistan. So is it a question to me again? No, it's really to Mr. Yong mainly. Okay. Sorry, I also assumed it was for Vin Fritz. Could you repeat it once more? Um, let me just also change to translation again because I didn't do that. Go ahead. Mr. Grotian, if you heard my question, because it also uh, relates to your work, you could answer it if you wanted to. Or could you repeat it for me as well? Sorry. So at what point uh, over the past month or year did you notice that uh, governments were not protecting those locally employed civilians who have worked for us so that they didn't fulfill this obligation so that the civil society has to step up? At what point did you notice I have to uh, 
do something about this because those responsible are not living up to their responsibility. It was the beginning of July after the statements and the reaction and the promises made and uh, seeing what actually uh, did happen in practice, what was implemented, I realized uh, just what you said, that this uh, responsibility of helping those under your protection, uh, those that you employed, that was just not lived up to. So we, we thought about how uh, we could help. We started uh, renting safe houses in order to um, grant temporary protection in Kabul for locally employed civilians, hoping that uh, that the, they would be able to get a visa. So we were that naive. We thought that they would uh, be able to be granted a visa. Um, and uh, the IUN uh, Bureau of the United Nations uh, communicated that uh, they uh, wanted to start mid-August and we're still waiting, but of course it's uh, too late now. And it's never going to start at this point. So we, started renting out these safe houses in order to keep the locally employed civilians in uh, Kabul, but they turned into death traps because the Taliban started uh, going from house to house looking for traitors. And so we had to stop. And the horrible thing about all of this is that the uh, procedure, visa procedure for local employed civilians can only be started from Afghanistan. So as soon as you leave the country, you lose your access to that visa, you'd be stuck in Bosnia or wherever. So they thought it's better to stay in Afghanistan in order to be able to be granted a visa. And for many people that has led to them being in the hands of the Taliban now, and it's really bitter to see that. I can respond now as well if you want me to, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, just to add to what Marcus has just said, um, in some ways, of course, you have to go even further back, right? Marcus's association, the Patenschaft Network, exists since a long time. And um, I'm not just the co founder of the Sula Alliance in uh, the United Kingdom, but I'm also a researcher, um, a senior lecturer at the University of York, who has studied this issue in the past four years. And in the past four years, I went to countries like the United Kingdom, Canada, um, United States, France, Germany, uh, the Netherlands to interview people who had already been resettled because of threats to their lives. So I think it's firstly really important to say this is not a new issue. These people were always already under threat. And that's also why it is so inexcusable that we're now in the situation that we're in right now. It is not fair to all, um, you know, to say that this is just due to the fast advance of the Taliban. So this is the first point, I think. Then the second point, um, also adding to some of the work that Marcus has done, um, many of us had organized nationally initially because the bitter irony also of this mission is that even though it's an international mission, there has never been international coordination to protect local staff and all of the programs are completely different in each of the countries or were even non-existent. You know, through my research, I managed to connect different people. And in June of this year, we decided to have a kind of symbolic moment where we sent an open letter on behalf of many of us to the Secretary General. Um, that was still with the assumption that the withdrawal would be on the um, 11th of September. Um, so, yeah, I, I can later send people the link of that open letter. I mean, in that open letter, we literally already start with, dear Mr. Secretary General, time is running out to protect NATO's local Afghan allies. In 100 days, this withdrawal should be completed. And the current acceleration of this process could leave as little as 30 days. Um, so the warning signs have been there from the start. Um, and then, of course, suddenly we now have come to a point where we moved from resettlement to evacuation, that's how urgent it has become. And that also meant that we had to shift our own strategy because I think up until a few weeks ago, we could still um, advocate for better policy. You know, we could point out to the, point to the inconsistencies in the policy between the different countries. And we could show that there were very problematic exclusions, again, totally inconsistent between the different countries with, Germany requiring certain time limits, um, the Netherlands excluding everybody who was not an interpreter, the UK had fired 35% of their own staff for disciplinary dismissals and excluded them. I mean, 
the wildest exclusion and so inconsistent. Until one and a half weeks ago, two weeks ago, we could still fight at the policy level. But suddenly now we have completely moved to a point where the only thing is implementation and practice. And that's unfortunately, again, is, is very chaotic, is very different per country, is still not very well coordinated, um, leading to the most outrageous examples where also, unfortunately, I mean, you mentioned before that Marx has been in the media a lot. Um, a lot of the policy and uh, a lot of the practice has been reactive to us as advocates, highlighting scandals, basically, highlighting unbelievable cases where I don't know, on, on Sunday morning, the Dutch embassy, even though they had to evacuate, still had the time to refuse a number of people. Um, they also um, found it okay to evacuate their own embassy and leave the passports of some of the people who had applied to their process inside of the embassy. And none of these people knew what had happened to their passport or what would happen to their flight. Um, there was another person who understandably was anxious and panicking and he had asked me uh, on the Friday before I think last weekend whether he should send the embassy a reminder about his application and I told him you know give them at least seven days and when he replied after seven days and asked them could you please at least acknowledge my asylum application they told him that his application had landed in their spam folder I mean you know th this is the level of kind of incompetence that we are dealing with and where also there's a very unfortunate situation. I, I mean, I completely understand people working on the ground under enormous, enormous, enormous pressure, but people like Marcus, people like Andrea, people like Winfried, we have a lot of knowledge that we have acquired over years and years of advocacy and casework on this particular issue. But governments are still very, very conscious of saving face and not sharing or not including us in our process being relatively secretive about what's happening on the ground at the moment. I stop there and leave it to Andrea or others to respond as well. Ja, Andrea Thies, die europäische Perspektive kommt ja noch mal mit einer besonderen Herausforderung. Well, Andrea Thies, the European perspective yeah. is another yeah. question. Yeah, I, I can hear you, I can hear you. I said it's a particular challenge uh, that is an additional challenge. How do you see uh, things evolve in the last uh, months and weeks? Well, I have to go back a little further. Not only the last months and uh, weeks, but I have to go back to the year 2013-14. I was a co-worker at the European Relief Mission in Afghanistan from 2008 to 2015. And our mandate was uh, originally meant uh, to last until 2014. During this time, it, uh, there was already quite a lot of pressure on our local staff, but not very helpful Afghan forces. Uh, who didn't uh, like people uh, being co international organizations. We also had, we already had staff uh, in that period, and we were preparing for a possible ending of the mission in that period, had uh, gotten in touch with uh, Brussels in order to find a solution for the civilians, uh, for the CPC mission, the civilian mission. Um, under the political leadership of the political and security committee, uh, this body is responsible. So we approached them, told them uh, what we wanted from them, but they uh, referred us back to the member states saying that for asylum questions and refugee questions, the member states are competent, that they couldn't do anything. Then uh, the mandate was prolonged until 2016. So there was a delay uh, and um, um, then 2016, the management of the mission um, uh, sent the same question to Brussels, to CPCP, and uh, told them uh, to take care of the local staff. And uh, they were told that if uh, 
the, the international forces leave, these uh, staff will be under pressure. Their rule of law experts, their civilian experts, and so on, um, um, have been working for you, Paul, uh, Afghanistan. So that was not a national activity, but an activity uh, within the common European security and defense uh, policy. This, and we received exactly the same answer from Brussels. And then the mission was uh, ended. And after that, uh, all our documents, including uh, the personnel documents of 393 uh, local staff, have been sent to Brussels. That was the situation. As a team of uh, former international staff, and uh, since 2016-17, um, we informed each other on the developments, what happened to the individual members of us, uh, what the development was in Afghanistan, how the country evolved, uh, how our local staff were faring. So we had news from uh, this, quite a lot of um, employees or staff. And in the middle of that year, a small team of international co-workers uh, got in touch with one another and uh, said, we see that there will be extreme pressure in Afghanistan on us. So we have to do something for our local staff. And uh, we were then uh, looking into the question what the individual member states uh, uh, are going to uh, do. And then uh, we saw exactly what has been described here in the, in the last uh, uh, 10 days of uh, uh, July. We also uh, talked to the, to the um, EU delegation, to EPCC, to various representatives and uh, said that uh, what we request is a joint and coordinated action so that not uh, only that uh, everybody does something uh, with uh, uh, her uh, his own criteria etc etc and the decision between CDCC and PSC and the member states is something which uh, was still open uh, on Sunday so in Brussels uh, discussions have uh, begun but until Sunday, uh, when the Taliban entered uh, Kabul, no decision had been uh, found. And that meant that uh, uh, from one day to the other, the whole strategy, the whole working method of our team had to be changed. And that is what we did. We're not a small group of international co-workers anymore, uh, but now we have uh, members from uh, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, from Germany, from Romania, Bulgaria, from the Czech Republic, uh, who are very active. And uh, we are supported uh, by staff from France and Spain. And uh, we have a very good cooperation with our Canadian colleagues. Uh, the third country, so third countries who supported the EU mission in Afghanistan. So we attempted to um, bring our uh, local staff into these uh, programs, but that was problematic. And uh, this is still not um, achieved because uh, not all member states have such uh, programs or such groups. And uh, and the programs were sometimes not open for you, Paul staff. It was said, well, we'll take the LAs, but for the members who worked in the CSDP mission, uh, no solution uh, was possible. Uh, they were left by the wayside. Currently, the situation is the following. We managed uh, to uh, evacuate three UPOL families to Prague, thanks to the Czech colleagues. The Dutch colleagues have also been super active and uh, have pushed their government into deciding that 35 UPOL staff um, have been repatriated or, or are to be repatriated uh, to the Netherlands. In Finland, there are still discussions 
going on. Uh, Finland had a program for ECHO and the delegation, but UPOL was not covered, was not included. And we had a very active management at UPOL Afghanistan from Finland, which was the largest contingent for a longer uh, time period. So here efforts are underway. Um, as to um, former EPOL members, the, the Ministry of the Interior and uh, uh, of External Affairs. So, uh, and th the target would, the aim would be to open those programs also to EPOL members. In Germany, there is a program for the reception of uh, local staff who cooperated in the police project, but uh, the, the, this program is not officially open to UPOL members, even though in the same compound, the similar uh, jobs had been done. So our endeavor was not to uh, divide uh, the whole process into several groups, so uh, to as to cover only the language officials or assistants, but to cover all uh, UPOL staff uh, in Afghanistan, all those who worked for this, organ this organization, because they're all at risk, at extremely high risk. That's a fact. So that's the situation at the moment. We are in. We have a cooperation uh, with CDCC. Um, that's where uh, these things are, are being discussed at the moment. Uh, then uh, decisions will be taken in the committee and we hope that uh, as soon as possible, there will be a more or less orderly reception of uh, UPOL uh, staff in the member states. What is also clear is that we cannot uh, talk about a well-organized uh, um, action anymore, as Sarah has already said. Uh, things have become quite hectic uh, since Monday, and uh, we have a good coordination, yes, but we are trying to do what we can as fast as we can in order to um, control somehow this whole chaos. Our former staff uh, contact us uh, all the time. For them, it's very difficult to understand that the EU, as, as an, in its entirety, uh, does not act, but that uh, the things have been broken down to individual member states. Our uh, standpoint is clear. Uh, if we have a common uh, security and defense policy of the EU, then we have to implement it. And that means that the EU has to take responsibility as EU in cooperation with the member states. That's uh, very logical to us, uh, but seems to be difficult to implement. Okay, but one is wondering why this ha why that hasn't uh, been the concept right from the start of the UPOL mission. Why do you only start to solve problems when it's too late? Hakrotian, I'd like to ask you, in the last five days, what ha happened and how got people out? Uh, we saw the evacuation uh, effort, but what happened before? I think you probably have more information and, uh, on, on that. And the question would also be what has to happen in the next uh, days and weeks, or do you still hope uh, that uh, many people who are desperate now uh, will still find a way to get out in the future? Well, um, let's look back uh, to the last days. The situation uh, has gotten worse and worse. And uh, after Kabul had been taken, uh, we had uh, some sort of um, a standstill at the airport. Uh, the Taliban have meant the checkpoints and don't let through Afghans. And on the other side, you have the Americans uh, who also do not deal uh, the local staff as a priority, but still people get through the way we see it. Uh, 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 they still fill lists with names. I don't fill them with names and um, delete uh, names from lists uh, because they are, do not correspond to their political standards, which is a pity, we believe, but it doesn't really matter because if you have 10,000 names on a list and uh, if you uh, think back to the, the pictures we've seen from the airport, I cannot say that uh, coordinated um, carrying out of actions is possible any longer. So it doesn't matter about very much whether you're on the list or not. And then uh, what we have not done in the past, what we failed to do in the past, is to, to uh, give information to the local staff uh, so that uh, 
uh, uh, uh, coordination would be possible, but this but this coordination function was never really taken seriously, and that means that we lost uh, an opportunity because if we had really uh, attempted to do it, we could have at a certain point in time. Uh, uh, taken uh, 50 local staff to one point and uh, then um, transport them over to the airport. If you don't tell anything, anybody, if uh, you just see the aircraft uh, land and start, then people believe they have to try it uh, uh, under their own steam. That's what people uh, try to do at the moment. And But if you have 50,000 people standing uh, beyond your gate, things become very difficult. It's very difficult uh, to let some people in um this is really a pity because we have lost uh, a good opportunity and uh well uh, we would have uh, a chance uh, uh, to bring people um beyond the taliban checkpoints uh we would have our ways and means uh, but our offer was not taken up which is also a, a real shame so we have lost a lot of opportunities and uh, people uh, live already uh, under um, uh, Taliban uh, in many regions, in Kunduz, uh, in Masar-i Sharif. Uh, but there is still some freedom of movement uh, because uh, the Taliban still have to establish themselves uh, fully. So we'll have to wait and see what is possible in the next days. So the way we see it, the airport, well, it doesn't look uh, very uh, hopeful. Uh, each day there are new air, aircraft uh, that arrive, at least that's what we hope. And uh, each day we re receive reports that people we know, people we have been trying to support, have uh, found their way into an airport and are in Germany. Uh, that makes us happy. We'll try to get out um, every last cell we can. But I think we could have done much more. It would not have been necessary uh, to let so many people um, fall into the hands of the Taliban. Uh, we had our own concepts, uh, but uh, people only criticize. We could have uh, implemented our concepts if the political will and a little bit of money would have been available. And um, uh, when we uh, were able to become active, the airport was already um, closed. Um, we tried to help. Same thing from other ministries in the that his own uh, office, his own ministry made everything perfectly well, uh, but there was just some sort of coordination problem. And nobody seems to be uh, really interested in the fact that uh, real human beings were sitting in safe houses there and no visa um, procedure was even um, began. Um, I will uh, recall this time and again, and uh, I will uh, not uh, um, stop doing that. Uh, so if people have to remain in Afghanistan now or flee to neighboring countries, we will still try to help them. Uh, we will see how uh, we still feel uh, responsible. This responsibility will not stop now. And uh, if people get into a region, we cannot reach, they're not uh, there anymore, as somebody may believe, but they still exist. Uh, I would like to uh, start uh, reading um, questions from the uh, audience. And the first one I would answer myself, is there anything that we can do uh, from Germany for those who need protection and can't leave? Today, I took part in a demonstration in Dusseldorf over the past few days in Germany, at least. I don't know about other countries, to be honest. Um, there have been many such demonstrations in order to express the horror about the lack of responsibility by governments that people feel. And at the same time, um, like in Dusseldorf, to show that um, they are ready uh, to receive those who um, need protection. Maybe that sounds like symbolism, but I do believe that that is important in this entire process. 
um, popular opinion. And uh, another question that uh, was sent was um, whether there are any um, reasons to believe that maybe governments didn't even want to protect uh, their employees. I don't. I don't know what Heiko Maas or uh, uh, about. Uh, what they were thinking, but that headline, Seehofer um, lets 9,000 Afghans um, uh, into Germany in May, whether that headline would have uh, elicited enthusiasm um, in, one or in, in, um, in popular opinion or in association. So maybe that uh, was one of the reasons that the politicians were afraid of such headlines and so hesitated. So it's more important than ever that civil society and masses, the broad masses of civil society show that we as Germans, as Europeans believe that uh, we should live up to our responsibility. And if that hasn't happened so far, then do it now for, for uh, God's sake, and um, we are ready to make our um, contribution. And Vinny wanted to um, add to that. Yes, there's another point to add here. The experience that we've um, made when there was a call to save uh, locally employed civilians on the 14th of May, in the districts, we found support. Uh, so we found support from uh, circles, uh, from uh, people who don't normally support this, uh, former ambassadors, uh, people from very different backgrounds who have come into contact with Afghanistan. And then, for instance, also hi the highest of generals in the military, and then even the traditional security police, even there, um, there was support. They were clear that these um, local employees were so important. Without them, you'd have uh, you'd you'd have been even more stupid, and you'd have been deaf and um, mute. So that was clear. And the second thing that was clear to everyone involved there. And the second thing is that if you were so dependent on them, then of course you're responsible for them when they're in uh, in such dire need. And of course you have to be reliable. Reliable allies and, and faith between allies, that is always, uh, it, that's what everyone claims to give us. And they were our allies, loyal allies. And so we also have to be loyal to them when they're in need. It's just uh, indispensable. And of course, in broad parts of the uh, our civil society, far beyond uh, the left or the Greens, uh, people are aware of that. And I think that's something that you can use, that there is a broad consensus, uh, there's broad consensus on that. There's also a petition running uh, via Change.org, um, and within three days, they collected 75,000 signatures. So there is a lot of support for that. I would like to uh, read another uh, comment from the audience. How much I hope that I, Goyami, uh, I hope that I um, pronounced that correctly. Um, you wanted to take the floor, in fact. So you have to be unmuted in, able, in order to be able to do that. Well, unfortunately, is no longer in the chat, so that's not going to work. I'm going to uh, take another look at the question. So many, uh, many questions are really uh, the same as the, as the ones that we've already read. What can we do from Germany? So if there's anything else on that, yes. Andrea Tees, please, on that. At the moment, with regards to those employees, it's really difficult to get to the airport. So today, we heard that the checkpoints were not as active as before, but, but in front of the airport, I mean, there was tens of thousands of people. So if somebody could inform 
uh, if if somebody is then informed that the Netherlands would take them and their family, how how could that be organized? The French have uh, really been better organized, so they have a meeting point in the embassy. Then they accompany these these groups to the airport with their military, so that within the NATO and the EU, there's no coordination. Every country does it their own way, the way we see it. And that type of coordination has to be done on the spot, locally. And we just don't understand why it's not being done. And we don't understand why every member state acts for themselves and comes up with their own procedures and their own um, methodology. That's a major problem for us to see that this, there's such a lack in coordination and many of the previous speakers have uh, mentioned that uh, and it, it's not being remedied. I'm sure they talk to each other, but there's no, there are no practical results of that, uh, of those discussions, apparently. Mr. Gautian. So the how of evacuating people and whether they have good ideas or bad ideas how to do it, uh, well, that's really their business. I don't think it's helpful to uh, come in there and to have your say there because um, that's the operational level. And everyone who has a bright idea to get people into the airport should just do that because every single person who gets uh, in the airport has a chance to board a plane. So I don't think that coordination is uh, necessary as far as that is concerned. And uh, as far as helping from Germany, there's really, really nothing that uh, can be done from Germany. The very few opportunities that are still there will be decided by those operating it. And there are some uh, ideas from uh, civil society, but we can't talk about this because when the ideas are publicly known, uh, they are no longer viable. So I'm sure that there are great ideas that have to be uh kept quiet for now so i do know about some people who have bright ideas there but this but civil society in countries like germany can't they can't really do anything we have to demand of politicians that they come up with a plan and a concept before such situations arise how to protect people that, that whose services we need who we depend on i don't think it's very smart and intelligent at a strategic level you know, quite apart from the moral level, but even strategically, it's not very smart to show people that if you work, if you're employed as a locally employed civilians by a Western government, you'll be left, uh, you'll be left alone when things uh, get bad. So you have to be able to tell people reliably under which circumstances, when and how you will have the right uh, to a visa or not. So in 2013 or 14, there was an individual case check. And so about 40% of those who uh, cases that were checked um, were granted a visa to Germany. So when the change was uh, happened from ISAF to IS, the follow-up mission, I thought that was uh, okay or bearable. But then after that, that quota was limited to two to four it, percent. It, it, it and when we noticed that in 2015 or 16, we criticized it, but nobody was interested in that criticism up until uh, upon the initiative of Mr. Nachtwey and others, the Green Party started to talk about this. So that criticism that we left people behind for years, and then the decision was that only locally employed civilians who used to have been working for us the past two years, that's not enough. I mean, that's not enough because we um, are leaving way too many people behind like that. And the uh, Minister of the Interior is saying it's about 5,000 uh, locally employed civilians and their families. That's uh, great because that's our figure as well. So if he says that, that he seems to uh, agree with, uh, with our network. Um, but those uh, that Germany picked to uh, have access to a visa, 
that's uh, and how that choice was made that's not uh, okay because many people were excluded and that was a larger number 4000 more so it's not enough to say they're all allowed to come so if the ministry of the interior today says that all locally employed civilians can come to germany then it has to be clear that there's nobody on that list you have to understand that there's not one person on that list uh, who used to work for the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs three years ago. So they're excluded if it was three years ago. That's excluding almost 50% of the people who used to work for us. And, and, and people just forget about that. So people believe the when we say that people are left uh, behind, that these are subcontractors, well, that's on top of that. We have directly employed local um, locally employed civilians that uh, we are excluding because uh, they were in, employed in the past. And then on top of that, the subcontractors. So I am not a member of any party, but I would just like to say these appliances, um, collective appliances were rejected because applications, these applications were rejected because they, the uh, statement was that uh, they need to check it and then on the basis of the individual case. But how can you collectively reject an application just on the basis that something was three years ago if you used to work for the foreign office? It, so if you are able to make such a decision collectively to reject, then you also you should be able to accept collectively. There's somebody who worked for us years ago he's still on youtube with his videos he was an interpreter for german generals he doesn't have a chance to say that he's at risk but of course he's threatened now and then and there's another bureaucratic uh, hurdle so that um, if somebody used to work for us in 2013 for the police or the federal army then you can only be considered under threat if you already told us that in the past. So if you say, for instance, that your neighbor is threatening you, um, then uh, you have to be able to prove that you've been calling for a while. But you can't apply that rule to Afghanistan. What kind of rule is that? Why do you have to prove that you've been threatened in the past in order to be saved now? I mean, we're talking about human lives and it's just not something that I can understand. Rotian, Sarah de Jong. Yeah, sorry, just to respond to that, because I think what's really important here is also that in this particular situation that Marcus is sketching right here, Germany is an exception, right? So there's also a major inconsistency that if you have worked in exactly that same role for, let's say, the UK or the Netherlands, that same restriction wouldn't be applied. And that's just the unbelievable thing about it. It also doesn't recognize at all that the geopolitical situation of Afghanistan has changed massively. So even if you weren't threatened a few years ago, of course, in this particular constellation, the situation would be very different. To come back to the question about what people can do nowadays, I think, I mean, Marcus and I, we were exchanging messages also that we are just feeling completely exhausted and sometimes well-meaning um, gestures to reach out to us with extra help are, um, are even exhausting because we aren't able to respond. But I think what is really important is that after this week or next week or next month, this issue isn't over. I mean, people also need to be welcomed in the community, of course, once they settle in Germany or the Netherlands or the UK, etc. And what is really important there is that, unfortunately, this is still a very stigmatized group. I mean, mostly young male Muslims who aren't always, you know, recognized as somebody who of course contribute massively to society. So it's very important that we make sure that we recognize the work we, they have done for us, that we make sure that they have access to the labor market, that they have access to education. And again, here, Germany, unfortunately, has some legal restrictions in place that make it very difficult for people to contribute to society and to integrate into society because their legal status initially is a temporary one. And again, Germany is a negative exception here because um, the UK is now looking to changing people's status immediately to indefinite leave to remain. And of course, that would make things much easier. Um, at the same time, I also agree with what uh, Winfried Nachtwey was saying. It is interesting that our government seem to be so worried about uh, relocating these particular people when not only in Germany, but also in the US, in the UK. Strikingly, even people who are more on the conservative right have always been extremely supportive of this 
group. One of the main journalistic campaigns in the UK is run by the newspaper, The Daily Mail, which is a tabloid newspaper, which is normally very anti-immigration. But under this name, Betrayal of the Brave, they have been supporting this. In the US, it has always been a bipartisan issue. So Republicans and Democrats have realized how important this issue is. So this is an issue where um, maybe we should take it out of the migration debate and just think about it in terms of responsibility from an employer to an employee, people who have worked for us. You know, let's not mix it in with Islamophobia. Let's not mix it in with um, immigration quotas or anything like that. Just think about it in terms of what are our, our obligations to someone who has worked for us and who as a result of that employment is facing threats. I think it then also becomes much clearer that we also have obligations that continue to the future about how we care for their psychological and physical wounds. I mean, unfortunately, again, um, Western soldiers served for six months, uh, American soldiers for 12 months in Afghanistan, but many of these people have worked you know, in very exposed roles for years and years and years and years. And many of them, unfortunately, have sustained both psychological and physical wounds. And we need to make sure that we provide them with the aftercare that they have a right to receive. Thank you, Sarah de Jong. Thank you again for your contribution. And I'd like to use the occasion now to give the, word, the floor uh, to um, our colleague, our Participant Dolani, I don't know, Max, could you unmute him because he is online again? Das scheint nicht zu klappen. It looks like it doesn't work. Ahmad Shaub Gulami, yes, it seems to work. So, Mr. Shaub Gulami, you can speak now. We cannot hear you, I don't know. We cannot hear you. I'm sorry, it doesn't seem to work. There was another request for the floor on the question which on the issue of the programs. Uh, Mr. Lucian Iremia, I would give you the floor. If you want, you can speak now. Yeah. Well, uh, well, uh, well, let's uh, let's uh, uh, let's uh, tell our countries, our officials, to observe, to um, supervise the developments in Afghanistan for four weeks, uh, discreetly but uh, very precisely, and uh, let them uh, uh, un un unfold what they want to do, their program. They, I understand, they have an an. Um, emblem and a, a new uh, coat of coat of uh, whatever an emblem a new emblem i saw it today it was a sun a book uh, an open uh, an open walls building uh, some grains and uh, some inscription in arabic i don't get it what it was said but uh, well uh, except that inscription it seems very open to me to a new future, to something new. Well, this is the what they say, but uh, they must have a program, uh, a, com a com cons concrete program uh, uh, to say what they intend to do and to stick to that program. And uh, first of all, they must uh, handle those who fight at the manifestants uh, to international court and uh, uh, let them... Uh, and not to stick with them, not protect them, uh, if they are true, uh, this is a thing they shouldn't do. Uh, if uh, they try to be de democratic, and uh, if they try to integrate in the world of today. Well, you, now another another point. Yeah. Uh, Islam is uh, some uh, a singular religion uh, in the world. Uh, it's uh, standing apart from the other religions who propagate uh, love and peace. They uh, mostly propagate, uh, uh, had propagated force and uh, uh, one person ruling and um, justice uh, that went to the extreme and uh, are not well understood sometimes. But well, uh, they had um, 
for foreigners before them, uh, like Karun Rashid in the 1001 Nights. Well, uh, this, this I think it was a uh, wise uh, ruler and uh, uh, justice maker. But um, well, now uh, let's see what they intend to do and uh, then take action. Okay. okay, danke für Ihre Frage. Um, ich habe also das. Uh, Thank you very much for your question. I'd like to say something uh, as to the second thing. The Taliban uh, say that they are based on Islam, but that doesn't mean that the Taliban really represent the Islam. That's something I think uh, 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 we can all say very clearly today. Others have uh, also tried. Um, to uh, say that they speak for Islam, even though they don't. So that's not a debate I think we have to do, uh, have here today. And uh, the first thing I think you said was, uh, I think was very important because the question is also, what kind of Taliban are in Afghanistan now? What, what, what do you, we have to expect? Uh, because we heard that maybe women uh, will be able to work in the ministry, in the framework of the Sharia. So there are signals which are probably meant uh, to calm us down, to calm the West down, uh, so that we think, well, it won't be that bad. Um, there was a lot of panic among the civilians after the fall of Kabul, which expresses uh, a very different situation the civilians expect. Um, could somebody speak on this? Uh, who would like to say something on to this question? Maybe Sarah and then Winnie? I'm happy for Winnie to go ahead. No, Sarah, please. Um, I mean, I, I think just to reinforce what Sarah said, um, also the Afghans that I speak to on the ground say to me that um, the, that this first propaganda to reassure the West what is initially being said. Um, and for them, at least, and I'm just conveying also what they say to me, it's not taking away their fears at all. There might also be a difference in the Taliban in the sense that there might be a difference between what some of the leaders say and what some of the foot soldiers do. I do think it's important really um, in general to uh, follow the saying that actions speak louder than words. And the Taliban has said several things also in the negotiations with the US of course that they wouldn't take over the country which they have done. And so um, I, I wouldn't take their word for it. And as I said, most of the local staff wouldn't trust taking their word for it. I also feel that there is on social media sometimes a tendency by uh, some journalists to just reproduce this information that, you know, the Taliban has said this, and so we're just circulating that as well. And I think it's really important not to do that also um, from a feminist perspective, when I see that male journalists are simply circulating that information, when we hear a lot of women on the ground already indicating that um, they have been barred from work, um, we know that female presenters have been taken off television, soaps have been taken off television immediately this weekend already. So to say that things are peaceful, um, but repressive, and that's okay, you know, it is absolutely not acceptable, I think. Um, behind that rhetoric, there is some serious repression that is affecting many people, um, you know, including women, including people with different sexual and gender identities, including people who are associated with what would be classed as an anti-Islamic or a Western lifestyle, whatever that would be. And as I said, I, I do think we have to really look at actions and, and not just look at words, which I also would um, apply to any Western politician, by the way. I have just uh, scrolled through the questions and uh, a few things have been um, answered. A few questions still remain open. For example, the question, oh, you wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, also das ist ja jetzt schon mehrfach angesprochen worden, ist ja auffällig, also wie uh, moderat jetzt also eben die Worte sind oder das Verhalten zunächst mal so auch. Uh, I have been wondering how moderate uh, many things uh, we hear are. Also uh, what we heard sometimes uh, locally, there was an interview of a woman uh, with a leading Taliban, uh, formerly 
uh, that uh, would have been a deathly sin. I don't know what the, the concept of deathly sin exists uh, in their world, but it would have been something of the sort. So that is remarkable. And it is true uh, that uh, this is probably done with tactical intentions so that women are not isolated right from the start uh, so that uh, we kind of, uh, so that they kind of uh, calm people down. But on the other side, uh, uh, I've also mentioned which uh, terrorist campaigns uh, have been carried out in the last uh, months and years. Uh, so these are things we really have to have a careful look at. Uh, there were um, attacks which caused massacres among civilians. So people who um, order such things and carry them out, well, according to all the experience we have, uh, they cannot change into peace angels overnight. So it's uh, okay, I think, that uh, we rather have a look at the, f at the facts, at their deeds, at their actions, but it's, it is also true that the Taliban are not a homogeneous organization. Uh, they have a hierarchical organization, that's true, but uh, at least uh, there is a, a, a difference between the people, the foot soldiers, the people uh, who have local competencies, who are more radical, more ideological than those uh, who um, come to the talks in Doha which are normally also elder Taliban's, and possibly there are learning processes taking place among that type of Taliban, uh, but locally in Afghanistan, uh, in the uh, course of the last months and years, there were certain changes uh, inside the Taliban, which is maybe their advantage uh, as to the, compared to the past, um, when it comes to state building, uh, they are um, in their grand majority not corrupt, which is a strategic advantage in a country like Afghanistan. And then I also have contact uh, to uh, those uh, who want to, uh, to have a large um, vocational training uh, project uh, been carried out. Uh, who work, I have contact with those who worked in those areas and they don't have problems with the Taliban, not at all and uh, they were visited in the, the changeover phase by the Taliban and were told, well, carry on your work. And that is a trend uh, that has been uh, palpable for years. And the expectation in the population, well, well, it's more that, okay, my daughter shall also be able to go to school and that might be po possible with the Taliban. So there were things that uh, changed. But uh, what we will see in the end, whether the Taliban will be softer or harder than in the past, we still have to see. Um, but it's a movement, I think, a movement which has a very strong terrorist component, but they're not all terrorists, I would say. They are also a nationalist uh, force against uh, the occupant force. So we have to take a very careful look at all this and have to see things in a very differentiated way. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to um, give Markus Grotian the floor because he has raised his hand. Well, for me, it's always important to see um, uh, in order to know whether you can trust a group of uh, people or not, uh, how we deal with our own citizens. So if every German citizen and the ambassador are evacuated uh, overnight, then I don't think that 36 hours later, we can calmly uh, reflect whether we can actually uh, talk to the Taliban and, and maybe it's not going to be that bad. I mean, today, uh, actually, I uh, saw uh, exec execution videos. I've seen them today. I don't know if they're real. I don't know if they're fake. I can only tell you that there are people in the hands of the Taliban now, and they shouldn't be. And I don't care if they are ex the more extreme uh, uh, faction of the Taliban or a more moderate faction of the Taliban. It was a capital mistake and a terrible uh, failure in terms of our own moral values, our own values. And we can't find, there's no excuse for us. I mean, 
if uh, we're seeing that uh, uh, under the uh, that people are now told under the uh, Sharia, you couldn't have done this. Uh, if they're telling this to our former employees because you would have lost your hand, then uh, we have failed, Ms. Tees. Most of our employees have already lived under the Taliban before, many of them when they were teenagers or even children. So they know uh, what effect that has on families. So they're very, very skeptical and they say, Within this time frame, there's hardly been any change within the Taliban the, in the, on the, the locally, the ones that are in the cities. So we don't know um, who's at the top now, what, what's happening there. And there are also members of ethnic minorities, uh, of the Hazari minority, um, who've talked to us. And of course, they would never understand how we we can under uh, how we could possibly um, think about supporting uh, the Taliban because they uh, massacred um, many of members of this uh, minority. So you have to uh, stay real. We are rather skeptical here. We don't really believe that and hope that they've changed. Thank you for this assessment. I also I try to keep an eye on the chat in order to find some uh, interesting questions for us. So some are commenting um, that they themselves have are in contact to people who are either in Afghanistan trying to get out or somewhere on the route to Europe and would like to come to Europe and are under threat and uh, maybe used to work as locally employed civilians and they're wondering uh, what can we do? So even I as a candidate um, receive many such, uh, countless such messages. There is um, an information uh, message uh, via the account uh, um, for uh, Mission Life, the uh, Foreign Office has uh, a crisis email address address now, and uh, we're putting it in the chat. And of course, Mr. Grozian already said it. The actual threat and how we perceive it doesn't maybe correspond to the authorities' assessment who should be on a list and who shouldn't be on a list. So this political um, reasoning to exclude people from uh, visa lists. And so I really think it's important to uh, keep counting. And uh, over the next few months, we will have a different government and maybe they will change and widen this definition. So, if that should that happen, we should be able, we should have the names ready in order to be able to help them. So let's look at uh, another comment. Luma is the name of the person who commented. And uh, we would like to give you the floor for your comment. Let's see if it's going to work. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. La Luma. La Luma. You have the floor, but you have to unmute yourself. So that's working. Great. I uh, had a couple of questions. My family in Afghanistan, um, you, they used to work as policemen and in the security area and they are in danger now. They can't go to their own houses because they are threatened. Uh, the people who have um, broken out of prison are threatening them, constantly calling them, telling them, we'll find you. So they don't dare to go back home. 
because then they would be found. So they are hiding in other people's houses so that they won't be killed. Is there any way to get them out of Afghanistan? We have documents to prove that um, they worked in the for the security forces, so we could send them to you if there's any possibility. Mr. Gozian, the only thing I can say, if I knew how to get a single person, even one single person out of Afghanistan, I would, of course, do it for everyone who deserves it. And that's basically everyone who is afraid for their life now. Unfortunately, uh, for someone who was a soldier under the um, Afghan security forces, it's difficult because uh, he didn't maybe have any connection to the, um, any German ministry. So even if you were trained by German forces, uh, uh, the Western uh, Alliance, your employer was the Afghan government. And for bureaucratic reasons, there's not going to be a possibility for those people to leave the country. I mean, 80% of our own locally employed uh, civilians who actually had an employment contract with the German ministry have been left behind. So uh, if you don't even have that, there's no chance. That's uh, really tough. There are also Afghan uh, police forces and officers who have already left the country a while ago, and they're now trying to get the family to Europe with the visa procedure. And again, it's very tricky to do that. In uh, general, uh, get family uh, reunification is something that uh, we should keep in mind because there are many people who are left behind so that there's one person who made it out of Afghanistan and the family is left behind. Yes, uh, the family, um, that's something that we like to forget at the moment. We have uh, locally employed civilians uh, who made it to Germany two years ago, and they're still waiting for their uh, family. So four years ago, the embassy um, was bombed and they had to wait for it to be rebuilt. I mean, it must be the same people who built uh, the Berlin airport because they still haven't managed to rebuild that building after years and years. So. The family reunification, that's something that uh, has been neglected uh, terribly. And you had to go uh, to Pakistan or India in order to uh, get your family to uh, reunite with you. And if you got an appointment, then that was for 12 to 24 months from now. So that shows you that families are not being reunited. I think that's also horrible because people have come um, to Germany because um, they are entitled to stay, but their families have to stay in Afghanistan and the German um, state did not react differently is very disappointing and something that needs to be mentioned as well. So in total, we still have 10 participants who would like the floor. So I'm going to try to give them the floor where possible. The first one is Sabine Schmidt. Uh, if you would like to unmute yourself. At the moment, we can't hear anything from Sabine Schmidt. We can hear you now. I would also like to know what can be done, but all I'm hearing is that there's nothing that we can do, actually. You can't even exercise any pressure to make sure that 
that uh, the soldiers on the spot uh, at least try to get some order so that those who have papers to leave can actually get into the airport and uh, are not, uh, you know, trampled or prevented because there are tens of thousands of people who want to get in and it's not that easy to get through even if you have the papers. So is there anything about that, the practical situation of that? So if there are any ideas uh, how to coordinate uh, uh, masses of 10 to 20,000 people who are afraid for their life and try to get through a small gate, I mean, if there was a way, then of course we'd be happy, but there is no such way. And that just shows how helpless and powerless soldiers um, on the spot are it's it's just like watching the titanic sink and you're in your little boat and you're watching it and there's nothing you can do i mean you could tell the soldiers to work better work faster it's not going to change anything and according to Nero, well they are talking on the spot but there's nothing that civil society can do now except showing politicians that what happened really leaves a lot of room for improvement in the uh, opinion of the people and that it should never be repeated again but it's spilled milk at this point we cannot turn back time we have lost the window before the taliban captured the country and now people are actually negotiating chips for the taliban and we just have to accept whatever the Taliban decide to do. We don't have anything that we can do because we already told them they're not going to receive any money from us. So we don't have anything, any way to make them do what we want. I mean, uh, you could say, well, we're we going to give you money if you let them go, but that would be like, you know, being blackmailed. So it's too late and that's very sad. Vinny, please. Yes. So in terms of the um, evacuation situation, society can't do anything, but there are still a few things that you can do which are not unimportant. So there is a lot of pressure. Uh, political pressure, media pressure now, but for instance, this petition, that's something you can sign the petition and then we're in a full electoral campaign mode now. And there are discussions even uh, among the candidates um, for the districts and for office now, and they are talking about this topic as well. So I think it's going to be a topic in this election in Germany now, a federal election, and of course, Another important uh, lever is uh, what the uh, sponsorship, the Partnerschaft Netzwerk, or Mr. Kozius, uh, achieved, the safe house in Kabul. That was done um, by means of donations, uh, an, an internet action. They managed to get enough money in order to um, rent these safe houses and that network sponsorship network also looks after people who are arriving here now. So you need money for that, you need staff for that. So that doesn't change the, who can be evacuated. Most of us are not really uh, expert military operatives um, who can jump out of the plane to save people, but you could do something here, at least for those people who do make it out of Afghanistan, by donating. And then beyond the locally employed civilians, up until uh, recently, there were so many um, development projects, uh, rebuilding projects, also uh, supported by German NGOs and international NGOs. So NGOs, which have been working there for a very long time and have great roots in the society, in society there, and they're very popular, but they're not receiving many donations anymore because Afghanistan has this um, reputation that it's a bottomless pit and it's pointless. But you don't even know what, for instance, the Freundeskreis Afghanistan uh, is doing in Yabori because they are doing good work. So at least you could try to support such islands of hope um, 
which don't make it into the media, so nobody knows about them. I think that's very important because we do have these islands of hope. And uh, of course, you can't uh, change the situation at large in Afghanistan, the, the framework situation, but you can help thousands of people and that's a lot more than nothing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vini. I think it's important that in this discussion, all the justified frustration about things that haven't worked, uh, we have to think also about the people who have been evacuated, people and uh, those who have not been evacuated, those who have been part of the resettlement programs should still be kept in mind. And Sarah de Jong also um, talked about it after such uh, missions. Uh, we still have challenges we have to live up to. And uh, uh, just because you have withdrawn, the problem is not over. I'd like to give the floor to somebody else. Uh, the one person I was going to give the floor to is gone now. So Katya Temple now, I'd like to give the floor to Katya Temple. Katya Temple, we still cannot hear you. Yes, now we can hear you. Welcome. Yeah, now it seems to work. Can you hear me? Good. My name is Katja Temple. I'm from Wendland in May, June, in the framework of a solidarity, solidarity mission. I was in North Bosnia and uh, spoke to a local staff from Bosnia who had to leave uh, in 2018 together with uh, uh, his or her 15-year-old sister. And uh, well, uh, I think it's often the way uh, it is with this person I know personally. Many people have already fled uh, uh, in the course of the last years uh, who had been working for the UN or UN um, associated companies in Afghanistan. And uh, the fact is that once the rescue effort from Afghanistan um, has gone underway and works well, we should not uh, forget all those other people. I have already had contact to uh, Vini Nachtbay and to other green uh, parliamentarians. And um, yes, it's true, it's uh, nearly impossible to make headway. Uh, and I've reached the point where I believe that we need creative solutions. And the creative solution could be that if we know people, uh, personally, we should take the car and try to get them out. Uh, there are, there's the possi possibility of giving them a diplomatic passport. And uh, we have uh, uh, frontiers uh, in Europe. I mean, uh, if you travel through Europe, not by plane, but by car, it's uh, really very shocking what happens there with all the cameras and so on. That makes me very angry. Um, so if you want to cooperate with us, I also wrote down my email address in the chat. And another question for me is the following. How can we help the people who will flee now because they will not be flown out from Afghanistan? Uh, how can we help them in their different uh, transition countries on their route, so to speak? Don't we need safe houses there? Uh, not camps with uh, situations like on Lesbos, no. Uh, safe uh, rest uh, possibilities with medical care. Don't we need um, embassies and consulates um, at which you don't have to wait uh, half a year? Uh, as it was the situation um, in Thessaloniki and Athens. So uh, we in Germany, don't we have to increase our German structures in those countries too? Yes. Thank you very much, Katja Tempel. Thank you very much for this uh, contribution. I'd like to give somebody else the floor. Stefan Wiese, please. Stefan Wiese, Stefan Wiese if you want, uh, you have the floor now, you can speak. Yes, I have two questions. One question is addressed to Sven. There will uh, certainly uh, much more refugees in the future. So isn't it necessary now uh, that uh, we arrange safe uh, uh, refugees paths also in Europe? and uh, that we um, uh, set contingents for all the various uh, European countries. Already now, the Austrian uh, Ministry of the Interior Nehama, uh, has declared that he uh, doesn't uh, 
think it's reasonable that uh, even one uh, single Afghan comes to Austria. And this is speaking for a green conservative coalition. And another question we haven't touched upon yet. In Afghanistan, uh, there are people we also take care of in our uh, in our um, in our church uh, locally. There are many people who are human rights activists. Uh, and how are you going to help those people who are still in Afghanistan? How can you open a secure um, flight paths uh, to them? Uh, we already hear that in Masra Sharif, uh, where the Bundeswehr was uh, deployed, uh, women rights activists have already been attacked or murdered, uh, reports which seem to be confirmed. So uh, you have to consider also that uh, inside the Taliban, the local leaders decide a lot about what is done locally. So what uh, their um, leaders at the political level say is one thing, but what their local leaders uh, on the ground do is another thing. And there seem to be already violations taking place. Uh, we have seen that there were demonstrations against the Taliban and uh, um, the Taliban shot at these people. These were my two questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan Wiese. I'd like to admit another uh, request for the floor before I give uh, the panelists the floor for the answers. Uh, the Yuma, I would like to give you the floor now. I was trying to give the, the floor before, but somehow it didn't work. Uh, Laloma, if you want, you could now speak. Aula Luma has already spoken. I'm informed by Max. Uh, I'm very sorry. Oh, yeah, now I'm, I, I recall. So I'd rather give the floor now to some of the questions have disappeared. Maria Eugenia Lutman Valencia, I'd like to give the floor to you now. If you want, you can speak now, but you would have to unmute yourself. I cannot hear you at the moment. I still cannot hear you. Now you seem to have disappeared again from my screen. Well, too bad. Then I'd like to give the floor to Ditka Lata. Uh, Lata, uh, can you hear me? Uh, you can speak now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Good evening. I'd like to uh, say hello to Mr. Nachtwey. We have uh, been talking to them when I was the commander of a, a local unit uh, who worked in the media in Afghanistan. Yeah, hello, Mr. Lata. Uh, my question refers to the future. Is there the intention to organize some sort of refugee organization, which uh, makes it possible that people, after having concluded the evacuation operations, uh, flee from Afghanistan, i.e. some sort of cooperation with neighboring states, and uh, which uh, organize some sort of safe area, I wouldn't say safe houses, from which those people could be flown out to Germany. Uh, has, this be, has this idea been voiced or developed? Is this something uh, people are thinking about? Thank you very much for your question. I can see that some uh, here took notes. Uh, who would like to answer uh, this? Who would like to comment on this? Which would be, by the way, our final round here. Vinny, Vinny, please. I'd like to speak on the next to last question. And uh, well, I could say anything as to the last questions, but the next to last question, women activists, women rights activists, and reports on first uh, executions, actually, of uh, human rights activists. First of all, women rights activists uh, are also concerned by the extension of the definition of uh, vulnerable persons by the federal government. And now they are included after this extension. In April, 
I heard this from a women's rights uh, activist who told me that uh, in the past that was the, the exception. You had to uh, really uh, prove that you were extremely threatened. And uh, now uh, they um, are apt for evacuation. But whether that evacuation then uh, actually takes place is, an, is another question, obviously. So the question, what can be done, what should be done in this respect? I think it's would, it would be very important that we have uh, that we rely on the further UN mission UNAMA. Um, international organizations, NGOs, won't be locally present anymore, and therefore the UNAMA mission becomes particularly uh, important. And uh, this mission has a, an important human rights uh, component, uh, something on civil uh, victims of armed uh, conflicts, and uh, they also will have to uh, look at uh, these things and tell uh, the world um, audience about these things, about such human rights uh, violations. And uh, something which goes beyond the question itself, but something we have touched upon earlier, the Shiite Hazara minority, uh, which in the past uh, had to make the experience uh, how it is to live under a Taliban regime. Uh, it was horrible for them. Uh, they have to be uh, looked at particularly uh, because it is very possible that uh, massive violations and crimes will take place in those areas. So this is something we have to have uh, particularly um, in our um, on our radar. Yeah, uh, maybe we can comment on this. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Well, there was the question uh, whether um, we think about a European distribution key. If I understood you well, I think if we manage an alliance of uh, the willing here, we would have made huge progress. Uh, as to the CFTP mission of uh, UPOL Afghanistan, uh, well, uh, 24 member states participated, not uh, everybody. Uh, also, third countries took place, like Canada, Norway, New Zealand. And uh, if only a part of them uh, would band together and say, well, of these 130 plus uh, family members, uh, well, uh, we'll take them all, uh, we'll receive them in our countries. That would be quite uh, some progress. Uh, that would be better until we wait, until everybody agrees to something. If we do that, we can wait forever. Uh, that became clear already in the process uh, in 2015. Uh, Mr. Nachtwey mentioned the NGOs. Uh, there are various, uh, many NGOs in the field of human rights, elections, women, who uh, through the European Union uh, were uh, fully covered. Uh, but uh, now they are sitting between chairs just like anybody else. We are in touch with these um, organizations and uh, where that program has been extended uh, for acceptance in Germany, including women and uh, human rights activists now. Uh, well, um, uh, we told them, um, um, go to that address, uh, because we don't know anything else. But they are also threatened, uh, because uh, they also um, have the label EU uh, sticking on them. So we also try to find solutions for those uh, EU uh, staff uh, outside EUPOL Afghanistan. And then those who have been working or who uh, had been working until 2016 or whatever, well, this is something uh, we do not look at in our effort. We said whoever worked for UPOL uh, as a dependent or independent uh, co-worker uh, and uh, is um, at risk and therefore entitled to our help doesn't matter how long he worked or whether he worked after 2016 or not. So our standpoint in this respect is very clear. Marie de Jong, I'd only wanted to say that uh, uh, obviously in different countries, there are different programs. And uh, well, that's not ideal. 
but uh, England has uh, announced the relocation program and uh, they uh, promised uh, that uh, they will uh, receive 5,000 people this year, 20,000 next year, which is far too, uh, which is by far not enough. Uh, Canada also promised 20,000, but it is important that, that uh, we support people who want to leave Afghanistan now, and that in this respect, uh, uh, we have an international effort with various efforts so that maybe you cannot, you don't manage with one country, but then maybe with a program of another country. And uh, these countries also establish uh, secure um, refugee uh, paths uh, by opening such uh, airways so that uh, the people don't have to travel over land uh, to Europe. And I also believe that it's always important that the civil society shows also uh, where Germany is in an exceptional position that doesn't look nice. Well, yes, there are other countries who uh, process uh, visa applications for a third countries for a third country because they have recognized that it's important uh, to um, take these people to safety. So they have a look at the documents locally and then they take their decision. I think we have to learn from best practices. So, you know, in, in, in the kind of following the principles of this mission, I mean, we need to have an international approach to this and, and learn from the best practices. Whereas what we see right now is rather like a race to the bottom, um, unfortunately. Herr Grotian, wollten Sie auch noch auf uh, Mr. Grotian, did you want to react to uh, what was said by the audience, or did you want to make a final statement before we conclude? I'm um, doing something else at the same time, try, trying to save lives, and I was distracted. So maybe uh, in a minute I could say something. Well, it's a quarter to nine. Uh, we would like to finish by nine o'clock. So I would like to uh, say a few words before I give the floor to Sven Giegold. I would like to thank everyone, uh, Mr. Grotian, Ms. Tees, uh, Mr. Young, uh, dear Winnie, and uh, for um, participating in the webinar, but also for the great work that you're doing also in parallel to this webinar. Um, our faith in uh, humanity and in European values and everything that we uh, stand for or are supposed to uh, stand for um, with our democracies would be even more shaken without these actions from uh, civil society or former members of um, uh, government, so uh, administration. Vinny? Well, you mentioned civil society, and uh, I have to say that we really have a, a great sample of civil society tonight here. Markus Grotian, a long-term chairman of the sponsorship network, the Patenschaft Netzwerk, who's a really uh, a pioneer. Uh, um, he's, uh, his main job is uh, an officer in, uh, in Mission and uh, used to be in a mission in Afghanistan and he has done so much uh, for civil society there. Markus Grotian, um, the uh, other members of uh, your organization can be proud of you and uh, especially uh, against the backdrop what uh, the uh, German government has done. If you had a whole, uh, if we were live with 470 people, we would have uh, standing ovations now, Mr. Grotian, I think you know that. Um, so thank you again. Sven, your wrap up, please. Your final statement. But I really try to listen. Maybe you know that I am more an expert for financial markets and taxes 
I'm not a foreign affairs expert. I'm not going to pretend that I am. But just a few remarks from my perspective. The failure that we've seen over the past uh, few weeks is, is of epic proportions. I mean, let's start uh, uh, with my home, the European Union. How can we send people on a mission and then employ people locally, encourage them to work for us? This is about the locally employed civilians, but it's also in the humanitarian mission ECHO to really uh, encourage people uh, to act as Democrats, uh, women's rights activists, anti-corruption activists to become active. And as soon as the war has been lost, this is what happened, you just leave them, you just drop them. It's just uh, unbelievable, it's abysmal. And the EU Commission, which has the responsibility or the Council of uh, Member State, just it doesn't even stand live up to their responsibility, but they just are launching a, a calls of, for action from behind closed doors. And if there's no reaction to that, well, not nothing they can do. It's so irresponsible. And I'm really wondering, where is Ursula von der Leyen? Why isn't she acting? Why isn't she making phone calls in order to try to save as many people as possible by uh, persuading more states to to take them out uh, of the country at this point of course the situation at the airport is such there that it's difficult to achieve anything and to get anyone out but one consequence from all of this has to be that things have to change this topic isn't new so behind closed doors there have been negotiations about this for months for weeks and so my sources, um, for my sources, I've heard uh, just for directly employed people, not subcontractors. So Germany had offered initially to take home 50 to 60. I mean, just uh, it's unbearable morally to um, start talking about quotas. This is like um, back to the Mediterranean for every ship with refugees. But this is our mission where you can't uh, really say, well, this person was working for the Netherlands. We have, and this person was working for Finland as an interpreter, so they're not our responsibility. We have a uh, joint responsibility and for other missions, future missions, this has to be clear from the outset. This can never happen again. So it's, uh, it's a moral, morally, unbearable and really there have to be consequences it's intolerable what has happened and then uh, focusing on germany and so the past uh, few weeks and months uh, what happened uh, as uh, mr grozian told us as well is also intolerable and again we need a discussion about this it's too late for the current parliament it's going to be the future parliament, Zara, you have to do it. So this discussion it has to happen irrespective of who is going to form the next government. It has to happen. It's of uh, central importance to uh, clear up how, uh, how something like this happened. And what about our vice chancellor? He just disappeared. Everyone's talking about Heiko Maas. And uh, I know that uh, with the concrete procedures, uh, the preparations for visa uh, procedures with this narrow criteria, narrow definition of who uh, would have the slightest chance to get a visa, for months and weeks, what was being said was that the embassy in Kabul isn't able to do this. Um, technically, they don't have the technical means for biometrical data. So the data has to be sent to Istanbul. And then they they said that they were afraid that terrorists might come in if it goes wrong. But uh, um, the other uh, 
panelists will know this, we don't have any biometrical data about a potential terrorist. So this whole operation was pointless, except for delaying. So for a long time, there were all these excuses not to do anything. And it was a delaying tactics. And now we're in this human humanitarian disaster situation. So I would also like to comment on what Mr. Young said about German integration policy. You're completely uh, correct. And we've been criticizing this for a long time now. That's exactly the point. People uh, flee their country. They come to Germany. And then for a very long time, they're not allowed to work. And of course, that, that doesn't make it, it, that makes it impossible to integrate. And then they're frustrated, and that creates massive problems for German society. It would be much better to just let them work. Um, not just the Green Party, I mean, uh, the trade, the Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of uh, Trade, they're also always saying we need those uh, we need the workforce let them work so somebody has to say it it's a, a deterrent a deterrent strategy so um many of the things that have been criticized by katya temple and other um uh, participants is part of this uh, policy in order to deter which is what part of the, of the government want and um so waiting for a consensus in Europe is going to be futile. I uh, really agree with Ms. Cheese. So we have to uh, cooperate and uh, come to solutions with those countries who are willing. We can't wait until we've convinced Viktor Orban. And uh, you also mentioned it, the situation in Austria. And I, I don't want to avoid um, um, commenting on this, this uh, coalition agreement, I mean, if you read it uh, for, for the Green Party in Austria, this is not something that the Green Party in Germany would have ever signed. The uh, There are very uh, massive differences between the Green Party in Austria, the Green Party in Germany, just like there are differences between the Conservative Party in Germany and in Austria. The UVP, the UVP in uh, Germany has, uh, in Austria has um, really a uh, gone a long way towards the right and this election um after the last election the the green party there had didn't really have a, a choice and uh, they had to make sure that the uh, uvp does not enter the government so they had to enter the government it was either them or the uvp so they accepted this coalition agreement with all the chapters, in, even if that's a, not something that we would ever accept in Germany. And so now they're, they're shocked, but um, well, and uh, then in the chat, there was a question that I also don't want to avoid answering. So what about the Taliban? Are we talking to them at all? And I think it's a very, very tricky question. But to just say, well, we're not going to talk to them at all is probably not very smart. You're, you'll, you're going to have to talk to them. There are already discussions with them. And to say that nobody should talk to them at all, well, that's just not going to happen. So there are going to be discussions. But Annalena Baerbock said it too. We do need an internationally coordinated initiative. So the federal government, uh, the German government has to uh, join forces with other governments in order to try to come to a common line as, as to how to deal with the Taliban, at least uh, in order to stick to certain basic standards. There is no clean, good solution to this at this point. So. I think this uh, type of political coordination has to be at least attempted. We have to attempt to get to something um, to a common line. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to pretend that I know what the results could be or that I have a position, but I think it's obvious that we cannot exclude talk, uh, talks to the Taliban completely. 
at least uh, in my opinion. And then one more point that I have been surprised to see uh, the past uh, few days. So this uh, situation of 2015 should not be repeated. I think that's uh, weird to say uh, because the West has a responsibility for refugees from Afghanistan. It's not the same situation as in 2015 to now say that uh, the asylum uh, convention and the refugee convention shouldn't apply in this case. I mean, that is uh, morally bankrupt, if anything, in my opinion. And if you think about the people uh, who are affected, um, again, we need an international initiative in the region, but also coordinated um, uh, by means of relocation, resettlement, and uh, programs in order to uh, find host countries. And we know how difficult it is. Um, the borders are pretty much closed, but we can't just uh, drop our responsibility or pass it on for something that uh, we are responsible for, at least partially. So we need um to have this discussion about what went wrong we have to save and get as many people as possible out of the country even if it's really difficult and then after that we need this internationally coordinated initiative in order to at least uh, come to the best possible perspective uh, outlook for, uh, for the future for people in Afghanistan. That's uh, my conclusion. And I would like to thank, uh, give my thanks to the three initiatives. Uh, Ms. Tees has already um, left us. Uh, oh, she's uh, stepped out. But uh, if you would like to give a donation uh, to any of the uh, networks here, and I think they, they need your uh, support and deserve it. As a politician, I'm ashamed that this has been left in the hands of civil society to step up. It's really the responsibility of, of, of our government, of the German government. They should have done this weeks ago, months ago, and they uh, it has been pointed out to them. Thank you. Danke, well, and I would like to thank Sarah and everyone else uh, who is here uh, until the next time. And thank you for uh, listening to us and um, hope to see you again. Thank you and have a good evening.